Hi, this is going to be a little different than my normal videos. This is going to be kind of like a, an essay, a video essay, in the like Montaigne sense, hopefully. But uh, so, what I what I've been thinking about quite a lot is the idea that, um, well, it's kind of like the idea that. Uh, there are no masterpieces being written today or that there are less masterpieces being written today um, there are less great authors alive today you know that sort of like that yearly article you see in some big newspaper or something is literature obsolete is literature dead all this stuff and I don't know it seems that a lot of people have like weird ideas about this and uh, what seems to me to be the case is that uh, yeah, basically my assumption always is that people never change and that affects the argument in several ways because that means that first of all that if there were geniuses in the past there will be geniuses today and when you look at a time period like the modernist era, you may have, you know, maybe, let's say, more geniuses than you had in the Victorian era. Nonetheless, there were geniuses that were completely amazing in any time period in history that I can think of for at least the last 600 years that I know pretty well. Like, that's the time period I know pretty well. And... There were definitely geniuses, multiple, alive at any time period throughout that. And so that, that means, therefore, that there are plenty alive today. And then, like, if you continue from that, then you would say, well, where are they? And, like, if you look back in history, many of the geniuses that we recognize now as geniuses were not recognized at the time. There are tons of examples. Uh, Herman Melville is like the huge example that everyone knows. He did not sell his books. They burned some of the later print runs because they wouldn't sell to try to make back their money. Uh, he had to buy, he had to self-publish. I mean, Proust had to self-publish his first, first uh, volume of uh, In Search of Lost Time. Um, there are still tons of modernists who aren't read as much as they should be. Uh, who else is like a good example? Uh, oh yeah, Leibniz. He wasn't known for his philosophy until after he died. Spinoza published his ethics posthumously. Um, Rimbaud got famous when he was even done writing poetry. Uh... Yeah, there are just tons of examples. Or McCarthy, even. He didn't get famous until he wrote All the Pretty Horses when he was in his 60s. So, uh, William Gaddis, he wrote The Recognitions, and because he was so distraught with the reception, it took him 20 years to put out another novel. You know, could you imagine if people actually recognized it for what it was and that gave him the inspiration or the the hope to you know write one novel every seven years we'd have at least another William Gaddis novel maybe two and it's you know, the world is less for not having one and so if uh, the assumption is that we should be able to find the geniuses easily that's obviously wrong um, so then the uh, the question becomes maybe the people who are complaining about it aren't looking and I think that's what it is I think the people who complain about uh, you know where are all the geniuses uh, you know they should be like they should be uh, shoved in my face there should be a list of ten geniuses every year that I haven't heard of that I can read and just give myself to that sort of thing and you can do that for past time periods, and it's very easy, and that's what everyone does. But, you know, for people in the last 20 or 30 years or so, you haven't had people tell you what's good. So 
it's hard to know. And then even you can go even in other time periods, like it took Melville what the the revival was like forty years after he died, thirty years after he died, from the uh, eighteen ninety when eighteen nineties when he died to the nineteen twenties when he started getting big again, and then now he's considered uh, you know an unquestionable genius. So it may be that you know some really great author that is the you know the next Melville, the next whoever. Uh, died yesterday and nobody knows about them yet and it'll just take someone walking through a library reading every single book that seems interesting and they end up finding the one that everyone wants to know about but I don't think you know writing articles about you know where are the geniuses or whatever like silly thing it is uh, that, that obviously doesn't help anything but for some reason apparently people like reading it I guess because it confirms the bias that, you know, that geniuses should just be handed to me. Which, uh, there was a quote by Vallejo in his human poems that the only good things are the ones that are hard to achieve, like death. Um, yeah, so that was the, that's like the main thread that I've been thinking of because... It seems to me the basic state of humanity is a lack of curiosity, even though, you know, humans are the ones that went from Africa and somehow made it across the Pacific Ocean and somehow made it across the Atlantic and whatever else, you know, so that implies a curiosity, at least at some point in history. But uh, I don't think that's the normal state for most people. It seems to me like any sort of revolution that happens, it's it's a small group of people that somehow convince the the large mass to do something and in that way I think I think I'm actually in some respects not in not in sensibilities but in something else I'm an aristocrat I think like an aristocrat and in many ways I don't I hate you know like fancy stuff I hate fancy stores I hate like that sort of fashion that idea that you know you have to wear what's popular now or what it, what people say, or even the idea of having your own unique style. It's, there's something false about it, if it's done in a certain way. But, you know, in another respect, I am like almost a complete aristocrat in the way that I don't think large groups of people can do anything meaningful. And uh, no, I've always thought this, that uh, there's, there's almost nothing more depressing than a large group of people. But then you hear someone like Leibniz say the, uh, you know, that this, the idea of the wisdom of the masses. You know, if you take a million people, the million people obviously are way more intelligent taken as a whole than any single person. But that uh, neglects the idea that that one person can know more than the million than any single million millionth person, than like in a certain subject than any of them. And they may be the only person on earth that knows that much about the subject. So in that way, if you combine everything, yeah, no one can know how to put a car together. No one can know the intricacies of quantum mechanics and how meter works in poetry. Not one single person, but there may be one person out of a million that knows more about any single subject than all the rest. And, uh, well, that's, that's quite obvious statement, but... Um, you know, that person, you know, I always hear this idea like, uh, you know, if you were in Nazi Germany, um, oh yeah, everyone, everyone thinks if they were in Nazi Germany, they, they wouldn't give in to the, the crowd madness and they wouldn't, you know, stand guard of a concentration camp. And then, oh, the idea is, oh yeah, every, everyone would give in. They, they all did back then. But the, the actual fact is not everyone did. Not everyone did give in. And it may be that most people who think that they would not give in would, in fact. But if you do a blanket statement like that to a group of, you know, a hundred people, you will be lying to some of those people. You know, you, you sit there thinking, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I'm cynical. Everyone would give in. They did back then. When, in fact, not everyone would give in. And not everyone did back then. Because, uh... 
it's pretty interesting there it's just like it seems to be a more recent thing and it's probably not uh like it doesn't capture the interests of people that much but there were quite a lot of resistance groups against the nazis but i'm sure there's a lot more books written about the sufferings of people in the holocaust than the uh, sufferings of people in resistance groups of that same like people who were german who were resisting and compared to the suffering of uh, you know the polish people in the holocaust or something which it's not necessarily a bad thing but i think it just uh you know a lot of people aren't curious so they don't search out for that sort of stuff that may change their opinion on something but yeah and i've always uh, i've seen some authors who uh kind of follow the same thought process as far as being an aristocrat i've seen uh you know it seems like it's a lot of european authors but you know there are people like elliot who completely like ejected himself from america <laughs> and i can only imagine that part of it is <laughs> the uh like that must be part of the reason the lost the so-called lost generation or the modernists left america because they to some extent were completely disgusted by how stupid everyone is <laughs> but and you know in that way they kind of like uh insulate themselves in their their artistic quarters of paris so they don't have to deal with you know the types of people who would vote for donald trump to put a contemporary example to it but then you know i uh i look at the other perspective that is exemplified in no country for old men by cormac mccarthy he has uh like interludes by this sheriff who gives uh, what I would say would be pretty much a perfect example of a conservative old man in America. You know, the the uh, type of guy who goes to church every Sunday, thinks abortion is immoral, um, you know. He's, he's the type of guy who has no uh, self-conscious feelings about proclaiming truth on subjects. I completely sympathize with that side, too, because... I think I think these sort of cynical intellectuals who uh you know they are they're always joke and they can never they can never uh, portray themselves as being serious because if they do they might be stupid uh you know that that sort of opposition to that you know like that that sort of aristocracy is I would rather have the opposition to it but then you know, you get caught in this trap, and then uh, then you either agree with everything or you agree with nothing. Well, that, that's a simplification. No, that, that, that's pretty stupid. But, um, but I think it's more reasonable to agree with everything. You know, like, this really is seems to me not, not necessarily condoning everything or agreeing with everything, but it's the idea that really is exemplified in uh, Pessoa and Vallejo that you know, everything human is me. I, I am I am everything human in people. And, uh, you know, I'm atoning for a crime in a suitcase committed by my grandfather for fun. Or I'm, I'm atoning for a crime in a suitcase, yeah, that my grandfather committed for fun. Yeah, something like that. But And then Vallejo, like, um, if there is a murder going on, I want to help with it. If there is a homeless person, I want to empty my pocket for him. If there is a, a revolution, I want to you know, stand in the streets with a, with a flag, you know, or if there's a, um, you know, if there's an arrest happening, I want to, I want to help them break free and help the police or, you know, whatever he says, that sort of idea that, um, uh, you want, you believe everything, you, uh, nothing human is foreign to me. And, uh, you know, that's a very persuasive argument too, but I've kind of, drifted from my original point somewhat i think it's all connected really but uh yeah i think it's uh very silly or it's it's at least it's naive i would say to believe that there are no geniuses alive now and in that way with that uh oh everyone everyone would be nazis uh if if the person saying that there are no geniuses alive now, that, that, that 
obviously means they are not one. I mean, in that, in that time. But I think if someone, if someone had the capacity for genius, they would be more willing to believe that it was capable in their time. Now, there are always times where everyone just kind of gets annoyed with everything and you you talk to the wrong string of five people in a row and it all adds up and then you you know say silly things that you don't actually believe when you're you know talking to yourself in front of a phone but uh yeah seems to me that but then there's also the 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 uh the conceit that people who people who read like only contemporary things they may have a biased notion of what is good because um like one thing that really helped me is i went back with the poetry magazine and they published like the first 40 years i think of their magazine it's all online or maybe the first 20 years or something anyway i read the first most of the first 10 years from when they started around 1912 to around the early 1920s I read uh, most of the poems I'd say at least uh, 80 percent and there were only a handful of authors that were that were great or really worth reading there's uh, Conrad Aiken uh, John Gould Fletcher T.S. Eliot uh, Oric Johns um, and these are the ones that really published a lot. Or someone like T.S. Eliot, uh, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock is the best poem published in the first ten years of that magazine. There are other good ones, but um, that is without a doubt the best. And in that way, that gave me a greater appreciation for T.S. Eliot because... Um, if you if you just like read him like oh T. S. Eliot's the best and only you read T. S. Eliot, that becomes the norm and then you think oh well you know he's okay I guess, because you're comparing him with himself, so he can only be what he is. But then if you actually go back, as a person alive in that time would have, been forced to do, and you happen across all this like mediocre stuff that you could have written yourself or all the stuff that you can't imagine someone was not embarrassed to publish. Uh, if you don't read all that stuff, you'll have a biased view that, oh, everyone back then was geniuses, or, or they were only publishing geniuses, or, uh, you know, something to that extent. But, you know, in reality, there were always just masses of stupid people that you can't even believe they exist. And, like, which, which is happening now. So, I suppose in that way... It, this sort of viewpoint could be taken as a pessimistic view that there are the majority is always just unbelievably ignorant and you have to you have to do massive amounts of work to even find anyone worth reading that's that's could be taken as pessimistic but it's only pessimistic if you assume that it could be different if you assume for really without any justification that it could or ever was different you know, when was the time that there were more geniuses than not? It's it's never the case. It's only the case if all you read is geniuses and you have no, uh, you know, sense of reality for the past. So, yeah, really, really this, like, you know, massive, like, deep dive I've done in modernism has really taught me a lot about everything. I really think that was, like, um, I think really the two greatest time periods of art is, like, the like the 1500s to the early 1600s. You know, you have Shakespeare, Quevedo, uh, Robert Burton, Thomas Brown, John Donne, all those guys, George Chapman, all those guys, all at the same time, Philip Sidney. And then you have really a big gap with like little sprinkles of genius, like uh, the Romantics and... Um, Lawrence Stern and just various other sprinkles of greatness and then then you get into the modernist era which I think is the, like really the second renaissance that's how I, I I really see it that way because you know all the all the poets that came together all the uh, innovation and in, uh, you know painting drawing sculpture 
music. You know, there are such completely new things that that sort of transformation in such a short amount of time, you know, maybe 50 to 70 years was never seen, you know, uh, since the uh, Renaissance, you know, in the last, it took 300 years for it to come around again. So uh, I think in that way, uh, we may be somewhat biased to assume that it should be like the modernist era. And that may be part of it, that we think, oh yeah, like, is art possible after Dachau, that sort of thing. I think that's silly too, but um, I see what they mean with it. But yeah, doing a deep dive in this time period has been really helpful because I don't think that like contemporary thought has caught up with the geniuses of the modernist era yet. I think there are probably like some people on earth who understand it well enough to build on it, but it seems to me at least, and now I have to say I haven't read much contemporary philosophy or whatever, but um, contemporary poetry does not understand the past. And uh, you know, if you look a hundred years ago, contemporary poetry was at the, the forefront of anything, the forefront of anything possible, as far as understanding goes. Like, I think, um, who was it? It was either, it was one of those obscure French men, Baudrillard, Badou, something like that, one of those guys, who said that contemporary philosophy has not caught up with Pessoa. And I think that's true. I think that's completely true, even though I haven't read hardly any contemporary philosophy. I kind of, I use poetry as a gauge that if contemporary poetry is saying almost nothing, then I, I can only assume that contemporary philosophy would do the same. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunate, but it could be that the, uh, the work that progresses thought, you know, uh, as well, maybe you could say reinterprets uh, past wisdom for the contemporary age. It may be that it's sitting in someone's desk because they tried to publish it and no one could understand it. And, uh, you know, once they die, they will uh, be read more or who knows. But yeah, I think this has gone on for long enough. I decided to make this video because I really like videos like this where people just talk about stuff, but I just never feel like the ones that I would make would be worth making and worth listening to and worth watching. But it could be, it's it's the idea where if something's not good enough to be art, it can at least be history. So maybe this can be looked at in a hundred years of what people who are 22 on uh, you know December 2017 would, would think. So, yeah. Tell me what you think about any of that. I know I just blasted a whole bunch of stuff, but something I've thought about a lot, and I don't hear anyone else talking about it, but I don't listen to many people, I suppose. So, that's, uh, yeah. All right. Death is a gang, boss.